my voice is a little bit down or else I would have been up there with them. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for being our Alpha and Omega. Lord, we thank you for giving us your word with promises in that, that we can stand upon and enter into difficult and into scary battles. Lord, we're thankful that you equip us for battles, you prepare us, and you provide for us. Lord, I pray for those of us here that are feeling weak and insecure, that are scared for the world and what has been said on them. Lord, I pray that your spirit of peace enters their life. Lord, I pray that we can grab hold of your truths this morning, and I pray that they can bring us comfort. Lord, for the places where we've been arrogant and sinful and messed up, we ask for you to forgive and make new ways for us. Lord, help us take hold of our actions and begin living in a new way. Lord, we ask for your son to be mighty in our life, mighty in our week, and mighty in our country. Lord, I ask for you to be with our president, for our congressmen, for our senators, um, all of those that we have elected and brought into power to, to work with us and to rule over us. God, I pray that uh, in America and in the world that Jesus Christ's name is known for love and for good things. Lord, be with your people this morning as we hear your message. May it come from you and may it be something that we can use and need this morning. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Well, good morning. How is everybody doing? I'm a little bit, I, yesterday we had Sarah's wedding and that's why she is not here, but I'm so thankful for the, the talent that we have that we're able to have come in and play our piano. Sarah and Drew, Drew was sometimes in the sound. Um, we, we had a wedding yesterday and it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a good time and I'm so happy for them. This morning, we're going to continue in our series that we've been doing called Made for More. Uh, we've got one more week left, so if you're tired of it, don't worry, we're almost done. Um, in this series, we've talked about how when God created humans, he didn't just create humans and say, figure it out, but he created us with purpose. He created us with a job and with a place in the world distinct from other things. We talked about how we are created, even within that, uniquely. Some of us are left-handed Benjamites, right? We're, we're the opposite. We're ironic. We're different than how others are, but God made us that way. We talked about how we're created to rise. Very often, the world can sit or send evil our way, and somehow, God can use that evil for his good. So with, we're created for the good as well. Today I want to talk about, it's a broader term, but it's this idea that we are created for promises, standing on the promises of God, right? We sang that loudly this morning, and I could feel it, and I could almost feel the message that I'm getting ready to, to deliver. I was like, oh, we're hitting some good notes. Thank you, Don. Um, this morning, as we think about how we are created for God's promises, I want you to go ahead and turn into your Bible to Genesis 15, and we're going to encounter the story of Abraham. Abraham is this man who was led by God outside of his hometown. God tells him, you've got to go, Abraham. And all along the way, Abraham has to trust this voice, this God. This God keeps proving himself and talking to himself. Right before we get to this scripture reading, Abraham is doubting the idea that he can have any kids. And God says, go outside and look at the stars and count the stars. Your, your offspring will be more than there are stars in the sky. And this shocks and amazes Abraham. But God is still making promises in Abraham's life, and we're going to keep looking at those in Genesis 15, 7 through 18. He said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, out of Chaldensto, give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought these to him, cut them up in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. 
Then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick, dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation that nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age, and the fourth generation of your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun has set and darkness has fallen, a smoking pot, when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces of animals, is what it's referring to, the animals that were cut up. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said, to your descendants, I give the land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates. This is our word of God this morning. And maybe you've noticed that the first scripture reading was from Genesis as well. And maybe you've also noticed that the scripture reading before that, last Sunday, we had some Old Testament in it as well. Uh, I have a book I read to Kristen last night. There was a little excerpt. And in it, um, Martin Luther, who translated the Bible for the masses, the first person to do this, to put the Bible in the common, lung, common tongue, even in the 1500s, people valued the New Testament way more than they valued the Old Testament. So in the preface before the Old Testament, Martin Luther wrote that Jesus Christ says that if you are searching for him, you need to go back in the scriptures. And the scriptures he's talking about are Genesis, the Torah, the Ketuvim, all the uh, Old Testament, that is, right? And Martin says that the Old Testament is like the manger in which Jesus lies. And so today we're going to kind of explore this idea that there's a promise in here um, with smoking fire pots and animals cut in half um, that God gives to his people and that is almost reinforced and helps us understand Jesus a little bit better. So before we talk about smoking fire pots, sacrifices, I want to talk about selling a car. Has anybody ever sold a car to a stranger, somebody you didn't know online? By a show of hands. I know Earl Hutto has definitely sold a car to somebody he hasn't known, right? He, sometimes there's some of us will go on Craigslist and we'll post our car is for sale and we're trying to get a hit into somebody to buy. Let's say that you decide that you want to sell your car this weekend, and you put it online, you put it in the newspaper, and you ask around, and finally, somebody calls. You get a bite. It's this man named uh, Duncan, right? And Duncan comes by, and he sees your car and he, on paper, and he says, could I come to your house and see it? Now, you're careful, right? You're not going to just let a stranger come to your house, are you? You said, how about we meet, how about we meet at Food Fresh? Someplace? public, someplace visible. He agrees, and so Duncan meets you at Food Fresh, and he gets, walks over to you, and your car introduces himself. He looks at the car, and he says, hey, do you think I could take this car for a drive? And you look at Duncan, and you're trying to be careful again, and you say, well, where does your car? And he says, over there, right in the CVS parking lot. And you look, there's a handful of cars, Sounds good, Duncan. I'll see you in a few minutes. Duncan gets in the car, he drives away, and you sit and you wait. And that's just the beginning of the waiting, right? Because 15 minutes go by and he's not back. You haven't seen the car in a while. 20 minutes go by, an hour goes by, and you are just looking around in the food fresh parking lot, feeling pretty stupid. So you decide you're gonna walk over to where Duncan said his car was, but there's like 15 cars over there and you're not even sure which car is his. So what do you do at this point? Uh, two hours go by. You need to do something, don't you? You would probably do what I would do and you make a phone call to the police saying, my car has just been stolen. The man's name is Duncan, he left me in food fresh. And when you call the police, something happens. It's not just you and the person you called, but the police activate 
the whole force, right? They're going to say, be on the lookout for this car, be on the lookout for Duncan. And because the police are smart, and because the police are capable, let's just say they find your car, and it's at Harry's. And they find Duncan inside at Harry's enjoying himself a good meal, right? And when the police go up to Duncan and they say, excuse me, sir, what are you doing with uh, Nathan Lashoto's car? And Duncan says, he gave me the keys. The police go back to you and say, Nathan, is this true? Did you give him the keys and tell him to go driving? And you go, yes, I gave him the keys. But I was expecting if he were to take it that he should give me some money. And Duncan overhears this and he says, what a great idea. That sounds like a, a great way to sell a car, right? This is a silly story because we know how business works, right? When you do a transaction and it doesn't go through, who, there is somebody that you can call. There's the police department, there's the justice department, there's ways to make sure that business transactions and things happen the way um, that we set them up. Contracts work, right? Now, a couple of observations about this little story here. When two people agree to terms and services, they commit, right? And right now we might commit with a credit card. You swipe the card and then you sign your name agreeing that you're gonna make a payment at some future time. What happens if you don't? You get fined or you go to prison. There's always consequences. Now, what happens 4,000 years ago? What happens 4,000 years ago where there's no phone to call the police? There is no such thing as the police. What do you do when you make an agreement with somebody and they take your cart and your donkey and they just leave town with it? Who do you go to? Who do you call? What do you do? What if they decide they're going to take your wife and your, your tools and your donkey? They take everything. Who do, 4,000 years ago, what would you do about that? Would you go after them yourself? You're just one person. I mean, maybe you could get an army's attention, but armies are paid. So you have to have something to pay the armies to get them to help you, right? What about a, what about like a, a king? You know, if you live in the land of Israel, maybe you could get the king's attention, and maybe the king, if he's not busy enough and he finds your problem worthy enough, to listen to it and send some of his armies. But what do you do, right? This doesn't seem possible or plausible. So how did people in the ancient world, how did they make business transactions? How did they go about living? How did they buy, sell, and trade things? And the answer is simple. Covenant. Promises. I tell you that I'm going to do something, and my word is my bond. When you're growing up, when you're a young man, you hear that phrase a lot, my word is my bond. Because as you get older, you realize that there are some men that all they can give is their word. And there are some men that their word is way better than any other signing of sheet of payment, legal document. If they say they're going to do it, they will do it, right? So in the ancient world, promises, covenants, and rituals kind of surrounding these promises um, were enforced to really drive home the importance of keeping um, society in running order, right? So in the ancient world, when you'd make a promise or an oath or a covenant with somebody, you would go out and you'd gather some animals. A heifer, right? Let's think of a goat, a ram, there's some doves in our scripture reading. You gather these animals and then you chop them in half. We don't really do that, right? But in an ancient ritual of having a promise, you gather about a, a series of animals and you cut them right down the middle. Once they are cut down the middle, you put them in, a, in an area exposing their halves in the grass with just enough space to like make an aisle to walk down. When the two parties are agreeing to make a covenant or a promise, I think my mic is a little bit dead, so I'm going to have to do this from here. But you'd have an aisle here and an aisle here of animals cut in half. The two parties would walk past, right in between the cut animals, looking at the other person and saying this, if I don't agree to my part of the covenant, may I end up like these animals cut in half? May I be dead? May I be cut off? May I be nothing? Have you ever heard the phrase to cut a deal? You ever heard that phrase? I'm going to cut a deal with you. 
comes from cutting animals in half. To make a deal, to make a promise in the ancient world, you would literally cut a deal. So may I become like these animals if I fail to uphold my end of the deal. In Genesis 15, God makes some promises to Abraham. He puts Abraham to sleep. He tells Abraham about the slavery that will come in Egypt, but he also tells Abraham about the hope on the other side. He tells Abraham lots of things, and he says, Abraham, this is what I am doing for you. I'm going to promise you that I have a future for you and your ancestors. Abraham has a hard time believing God, so God says, get me some animals, a heifer, a goat, some doves. And as we're reading, you notice that God tells Abraham to get these animals, but then Abraham just goes to cutting on his own, right? Because Abraham knows what to do. Abraham is not waiting for God to tell him to cut a covenant. When God tells him to get the animals, it's like God telling him to get the contract. He knows what is happening. He gets the animals, he cuts it, he falls asleep, and then something happens. And before we get into that, I want to go down this rabbit hole for a second. In the ancient world, we t- I've talked about this before, the gods, they, whenever you thought about an ancient god, the idea that, that god cared about you was ridiculous. You've heard the stories of Zeus and Apollo They never cared about humans. They would rape humans. They would torture humans for fun. But in this Genesis story, we get this story of God committing to Abraham, making promises about his future, saying, I'm going to be there with you, not to torture you, and not because when you have enough children, uh, thousands and thousands of children, then you can really glorify me. But I'm doing this because I love you. My promises are promises of love. In the ancient world, the gods were thought to want to hurt you. But Jesus shows us something else, and even the God of the Old Testament shows us something else. Abraham asks, how can I know that I'll gain possession of everything that you've said, God? And God says, cut, you know, let's make a covenant. Bring me these animals. Abraham starts cutting. Abraham falls asleep, and when he wakes up, he sees something. And we don't talk about this too much, but it's smoking fire pots, Scooby-Doo style, going through the aisles of animals cut in half. Abraham looks at this, and it's a strange sight, and he's not really sure what to make of it at first, but then he knows what it is. The smoking fire pots are the presence of God. God is creating a covenant with Abraham. God said, I'm going to do this, this, and this for you, and he, God walks through the cut-up animals, and he's, as if to say, if I don't hold up my end of the bargain. May I be destroyed. Now, Abraham, we read, right? What does Abraham do? Nothing. What are you supposed to do in a covenant? Two people are supposed to walk through the animals. But God does it for both of them. God tells Abraham, you don't need to walk because this isn't about you and what you are doing. This is about me and my love for you. So when God makes promises, it's not necessarily dependent upon you fulfilling your end of the deal or your end of the bargain. With this passage in Genesis 15, God says, I've got it covered, and I'm going to commit to holding up both ends of the deal. Abraham, if you fail, I'm still liable. If I fail, I'm still liable, but I won't fail because I am your God. We are created not just for our promises, but for the promises that God speaks over our life. As you read scripture, you will find moments where humans are failing left and right, but it doesn't matter because God has spoken a promise over their life and over their future. Our first scripture reading was from Genesis this morning, but it was the story of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is a story that we've all heard hundreds of times from when we were small to, when, to even now, this morning, right? Now, in the Tower of Babel story, we hear about humankind coming together at the beginning of Genesis, and they're making this one great city. And they're wanting to make this city to kind of oppose God and God's power. Now, they have worked before, it said in our scripture, that they were building not with rock, but with bricks they were making. 
and mortar they are making. This is, an, this is technology. The Bible's telling us that as they're constructing things, they are thinking about it. They make and build and construct, and they're trying to make something to, uh, to bring them to God. A chapter before this, though, God tells humankind, I want you to enjoy earth and be fruitful and multiply and fill it. Fill the face of the earth. Humans say, that sounds like a great idea, and they get to work doing the opposite. God says, I've got a plan for humans that involves being fruitful and filling the world. And they say, and, you know, typical human responses, sounds good. I'm going to do what I want to do, though, right? So the Tower of Babel story, these humans, they build this tower, and God hands down a diverse set of languages to confuse them. Some people look at this as God is cursing them with multiple languages, cursing them with diversity, right? This is where the language comes from. It's meant to confuse and disorient them. But what does it do to the people of Babel? It causes them to be fruitful and fill the earth. No long can they stay in the same spot, but now they have to do what God asked. What God had intended for the world, he had promised that the world would be filled with humans. Human arrogance tried to get in the way of that. God said, it doesn't matter. I will still find a way to make sure that my promises get through. Has anybody ever made a promise to you and broke it? I got a big one. When I was, when I was, um, I had a birthday party and people said, Nathan, what would you like to do for your birthday party? And I said, mom and dad, can we just go to your house and then just have the day there? And they said, yes, we can have the day there. We promise we'll be there for you. And I show up and I get there. First hour, nobody came. Kind of like that story, right? Was selling the car. Second hour, nobody came. My phone had messed up or something. They went to a different location but they had forgotten to tell me. Now, what's funny about that was they had intended and the intentions were all there, but what it looked like was it looked like a promise was broken, right? Sometimes when promises are broken, even with good intentions, it can leave hurt feelings. Throughout the Bible, God says, I'm making promises on your life and you're gonna do things to get in the way of them. You're gonna do things to mess up the promises for a family, for a future that I have for you, but it doesn't matter because I'm going to be there pushing through the promises. You cannot stop God's promises for your life. You can make it difficult, you can delay them, but you cannot stop the promises that God has on your life. We are created for more, more than what we deserve, more than what we've been given. We're created for promises. God sends his son Jesus to us. And Jesus is the ultimate example of God committing to us. God making a commitment. You know, even though we've messed up, even though we've made a mess of humanity, what type of world does Jesus enter into? A whole happy world or a broken, beaten world? And his promise is the same. My love for you will never end. The work that I have for you will never be exhausted. God has a kingdom that he is building. And once we realize that those promises that he has spoken in our life can't be stopped, maybe we'll stop fighting. Maybe we won't need to be disoriented and confused to make God's promises real in our life, but maybe we can just walk with him in those promises. Jesus commits to us even when we fail to, to do our part. God commits to us even when we fail to do our part. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for promises. I thank you for examples in your Bible of you making promises to people who are less than perfect, less than ideal. Help us in here to grab hold of those promises. Lord, when the world speaks hardship and evil, when the days just drag and we can't find any good news, help us to grab hold of one of the promises that you've spoken in our life. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son, and we thank you for his love that he sends to us no matter what steps we take. Lord, be with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.